Okay, so the trip is over. Yeah. You've, uh, you did everything you said you were going to do. Mm -hmm. And now is the easy part or the hard part, writing the book? Uh, the book is infinitely more difficult. And it's ironic that I named the boat the Flatboat Patience. Yeah. Because it just requires a lot of patience. Uh, you have to recreate the whole trip. Mm -hmm. There's tons of research to do. I want, I want to give the reader um, everything they ever needed to know about the flatboat experience and how integral it was to the American experience of becoming a successful, prosperous nation uh, globally. And so that's a lot of work. It's more work getting the book done than floating the river. Really? Oh. Not as dangerous, but more work. Uh, it, it's dangerous to your mental health. I mean, a book is a tough thing to write. You have, so. I counted, over 100 books in there mm -hmm. on various parts of American history. Right. Uh, you've got to read all those. I will read all of those. And then you have to come up with your own theory about mm -hmm. how this fits into American history. Has anything surprised you yet? Uh, the, surprise, the most surprising thing is the diversity of the flatboats that were out there and the experiences that happened on the river. Like, there were evangelists on the river. There were Shakespearean troops on the river. It's speculated that uh, Abraham Lincoln, who made two trips down the river when he was a 19-year-old and a 21-year-old, probably was exposed to his first Shakespearean drama uh, during those trips. And that's kind of very universal for the American experience and what the flatboat era meant. Uh, so, yeah, the, it, it, it's just the diversity, the complexity of the experience, the number of uh, flatboats that were built, uh, there were flatboats that came down the rivers and then joined a bigger flatboat to the next river and so forth. So just a tremendous amount of complexity and you have to sort that all out and write just enough about each complexity to make the book work. Now, what, how did this trip differ from your other, I mean, you've written several travel books right, uh, from, right. from your youth, but the biggest, the one most people know you for is the Oregon Trail. Right. How did this trip differ and what was similar? I th I th well, what was similar was that uh, you're taking a risk and you have to accept that a lot of the advice that you're getting from people is inaccurate. Um, what was dissimilar, what was really new was I'm not a nautical guy, I'm not a boat guy. Uh, like on the Oregon Trail, I've been a wagon guy all my life and I know mules and horses etc. But it's very interesting psychologically what happens to you as a person. When you feel that you don't know much about boats and river currents and, and, and all that sort of thing and you know which way to turn when a tugboat is coming at, at you and all that. When you feel you don't know that well, uh, in fact you're exaggerating the difficulty because I knew pretty well after a month I knew really well what to do and there were some folks that we brought along the river with us at first because supposedly they had expertise and what I ended up learning was that I learned more from them about what they were bad at and what they didn't know uh, then I learned from them what they did know, and that's a really interesting intellectual quandary. Now, like the Oregon Trail, you're going to be filling in gaps that are not taught in school. That, right. That, that, right. Are, that people have perceived from Hollywood movies and a little bit else. Right. Um, just without giving away too much of the book, what was one of the big surprises? All right, I'll, I'll tell you one big surprise, and then, and then we're not going to give away anymore from the book because it could be a couple of years before it's out and you know one of the largest and most tragic migrations in American history that is now celebrated is the so-called Trail of Tears which was the uh, transfer by the order of President Andrew Jackson 
of the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, etc., from their native lands uh, in the Carolinas and Tennessee to Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Well, once President Jackson had experimented with that, then there was a whole new transfer the African American Trail of Tears. Between 1828 and the Civil War, more than a million black American slaves were transferred from Maryland and Virginia to the new cotton lands along the Mississippi Delta in horrible conditions. They were, they were transported in, uh, uh, with chains around their neck 15, 20, 30 at a time. And the great wealth of the Virginias was no longer tobacco because it had declined as a product. So, so this was the historic issue in the southern economy at the time, which was tobacco had declined in Virginia and wasn't generating uh, the millions and millions and millions of dollars or pounds a year that it had uh, during the pre-revolutionary era. But suddenly, cotton was king. So the Virginia planters no longer looked to agriculture for the wealth. They looked to the slaves they owned. So there was a whole trail of tears. And it was very dramatic, very uh, moving. About a million slaves, about a million black African Americans were transferred from Maryland and Virginia. Down the rivers? Well, the, the, the term was, I'm being sent down the river, which slaves just totally feared. It was an awful thing. Um, and I, I had, there, there, so there's a black trail of tears, an right. African American trail of tears, which me, a well-read guy, I mean, I know American history, I'd never heard of. Brought yeah. up Andrew Jackson, which yeah. has played a critical role in the trip. And it can't be escaped that the current president, or right. possibly the current president at the time that this book is published, worships Andrew Jackson. He has a picture of him well, hanging. Well, that might be more Steve Bannon yeah. than, than uh, uh, Donald Trump, because I don't really give Donald Trump enough credit of having read history and knowing that. But Bannon suggested that he put a portrait of Andrew Jackson in the Oval Office. And you traveled through parts of the country, mm -hmm. the Rust Belt, um, yes. among others, at the time that the Trump phenomena was becoming. It was the summer of Trump. And you really, probably before anyone else, were telling me something's going on here. Something's going on because I, I pass utility plant after utility plant that was once serviced by coal and you can look at the facility and see where the coal came through. And now they're being transferred to gas projects. And we stopped in Weirton, West Virginia. And we had a very interesting experience there with the, uh, with the uh, owner of uh, Marina in Weirton. And he said, well, Obama's wrecked our economy and he's wrecked this Virginia, West Virginia, Etc. And his explanation was, coal is dying and it's it's decimating this region. And in fact, it in fact it was. But there were reasons that coal was dying, which had nothing to do with President Obama. So it, w it was a fascinating trip that way. It was the summer of Trump. And you saw the shift, probably. We I we I probably saw the shift more intimately. I'll never forget in New Madrid. Missouri, which is a famous stop uh, along the uh, along the river, my I had to redesign my anchors. My anchors are from the people that I left that didn't give me the right anchors. I had to redesign my anchors and have them welded out of uh, John Deere disc arrows. Mm -hmm. And the guy that did the welding for me was someone who had just been laid off 
from an aluminum plant along the river that had laid, just laid off 2,000 workers. That's the story of America. That's the story of Trump, Trump triumphant. No. Yeah. Now, you have chosen to write the book. Right. Uh, and we're here on a farm mm -hmm. in Tennessee, surrounded in Amish country, which right. you have an affinity for. Right. Um, why this location? You could have written it anywhere in the country. Why did you settle on? Well, I was looking for uh, a place that was equidistant to everywhere I had to visit for the trip. I, you make these trips, and then you're in too much of a rush. You, you have too many issues every day while you're making the trip. Surviving. To complete, just surviving, making the trip happen to uh, complete interviews with everybody you want to talk to. And so I wanted a place that was equidistant, close enough to Owensboro, Kentucky, or Pittsburgh, or Paducah, Tiptonville, all those places along the Ohio and the Mississippi River, Natchez, New Orleans. And so this area of Tennessee was right in the middle of all that. I can get to everything that I all the re-interviews I have to do in about five hours anywhere along the trip and so I settled down here and at the same time I've been a uh, close associate friend uh, working on their farms of the Amish and the Mennonite uh, for most of my life so uh, and it, this part of Tennessee is very heavily Amish. I, my neighbor there, my neighbor there, my neighbor there, my neighbor there is all Amish. And so it's, it's a great experience to be among the Amish. And probably once I've finished my Mississippi River book, I'll be ready to do an Amish book. Mm -hmm. yeah. Two questions. One, are there areas that you're finding gaps in the research that are frustrating, things you yeah. really want to fill in or find out or disprove? Sure. There, there's um, one big area in my research is that it's always been written that the, that the uh, flat boaters sail their boats downriver uh, to New Orleans or Natchez or Cincinnati or whatever, and then they were ripped apart and the lumber which was a considerable part of their investment was used to build churches and houses and sidewalks and so forth and it, it's it, it's sort of an urban myth and I just haven't been able to find a lot of documentation for that so I'm hoping that uh, I'm, I'm writing letters of inquiry and so forth uh, to see if I can't document that. Uh, that's the big one. Yeah. Now, as we, as we interview, we hear in the background the hoofs of an Amish wagon. Right. What, it is, what is it about you? Because this has been a theme for a long time in your life about mm -hmm. the Amish that you're so... Well, the big thing is that I'm a student of American history, and religious history is critical to our growth. Uh, all the colonies and then all the early states grew because of religious freedom. Uh, and the Amish sort of symbolize a group that came here when they were under persecution. Yeah. So, so they represent the extreme side of a religious freedom coming to America. Okay? And in our own modern times, there's been suits, lawsuits in a number of states where the states were saying, They're, you're not living up to our educational standards and so forth. And the Amish have always won on the grounds of going right up to the Supreme Court, religious freedom. So this is, uh, it's, it, 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 it's important for Americans to understand that the origins of this country were we offered religious freedom, but that it's still a conflict. And I also think the Amish are fascinating because they, they offer uh, a protection, a preservation of old-fashioned values like woodworking and harness making and, and uh, simple good
crops without a lot of chemicals in them and everything. And they're very successful wherever they're located. And so that tells us something important about what has religious freedom in America wrought. I mean, you asked me, what did I learn about this trip? And I just think from this trip, what did I learn from this trip? I mean, I think it's supremely ironic that I named my boat the Patience because it took a huge amount of patience to get down the river and all the problems we confronted. It's 500 miles on the Mississippi between marinas and they said we couldn't get there because we couldn't get gas. Well, we had no problem finding gas. Uh, we had an electric, electric bike that we could take to it and, and so on and so forth. A lot of patience though, keeping the boat provisioned with gasoline for the motor, ice, which we needed just to survive, water. and food. And water. And, and water. Portable water. And water, potable water. So, uh, you know, patience, 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 which you do not associate with modern times yeah. a lot. Uh, so that was important. And it was also a, a long educational process for me realizing that in my early to middle 60s, I had already provisioned myself with the knowledge of how to make this trip. But I, I didn't appreciate that I had. And it was a process of teaching myself, you know, having nightmares in the middle of the night. How am I going to get through this next section of rough current and weather and this and that? And it was a knowledge of teaching myself you're better prepared. You know what you need to know more than you. And that is significant because the flatboat experience, which on the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, which created the American global economy, was undertaken by untrained, uneducated farmers. And they had to teach themselves going down the river. There were four or five thousand flatboats going down the river every year, as many as 20,000 men worked on the two rivers every year, bringing those flatboats down. And they were completely inexperienced. They, they had no, and so uh, it was teaching themselves to conquer fear. Two years, at least, to finish the research, right? The yeah. Book, make all those return trips. All it's those a total trips. pain in the ass to write the book. It's, the, writing the book is a lot more tough, Danny, than then, going down the river together. There's no All current right. to write the book with. No, and there's not beautiful scenery and this, that. You gotta be frickin' inside in your office and working every day. Right. You know. All right. That's great, Dan. Let's wrap it up. It's wonderful to be with you.